Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe, uh, president of the Canadian Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us for another episode, episode, edition of uh, City Talk. Um, I have notes that I started when we first started these, uh, and uh, I refer to them during the introduction each time. And uh, uh, that was when we were doing our first. And I think you gents are our 22nd, you might be our 23rd City Talk. The appetite in this country for trying to make sense of what the impact of COVID-19 has been on our cities and on our municipal governments and what it's likely to be going forward is it just, just lots and lots and lots of questions. So we are so appreciative that people like you would sandwich into your busy days time to share your own thoughts and your own observations about what you've been seeing and what you've been grappling with and what you think the future is. Um, we initiate these broadcasts from Toronto, which is the uh, traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek and the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, which was signed with multiple Anishinaabeg nations. Um, and we are always uh, uh, taking seriously our obligation to come to terms with the reality of our ancestry and the history of the lands in which we are uh, privileged to occupy. This has uh, been an enormously uh, challenging time for municipal governments. Uh, CUI early on in the in when COVID hit, we wanted to create some tools that would allow us to be able to learn from each other because we're in the connective tissue business. So we put up CityWatchCanada.ca and CitySharecanada.ca, and those are both platforms that continue to be robustly populated by volunteers and partners across the country to actually pay attention to what governments like yours have been doing, but also what community groups and uh, business associations and individuals and all the kinds of robust ways in which communities have innovated and responded. And we're anticipating there'll be a lot more of that uh, because we're heading into the next phase, which is, uh, I, you know, I, I have I used this anecdote before that I was in New Orleans after Katrina and I finally moved there uh, uh, about, um, uh, I guess a year after the storms had hit. Actually, I had been there regularly, but then I actually moved there and I got there and the street lights were on and I thought, oh, it took me too long to get here. But what I found was it actually took a long time that the recovery is not a fast thing. And we are gonna have lots of adjusting to do and lots of when, when we leave the emergency stage. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that we're cognizant that we're not through the emergency stage in many, many parts of Canada. We have thousands of Canadians who are still on the front line saving lives and keeping people safe. And those, these conversations are never intended to replace that. Um, uh, if you're tuning in from uh, somewhere, tell us where you are. Uh, there's a really robust chat function in Zoom. And uh, I watch the chat and uh, the two mayors may watch the chat as well if they choose to. But you can uh, post questions there. And often what happens is people in the chat uh, respond and answer each other's questions. And we videotape this session and we also uh, archive the chat. So whatever you put up in that chat, folks, it stays there. Just know, just know that. So not like Vegas, it comes with you. And um, uh, and we're really interested in hearing what questions you have for the mayors and uh, areas that you think that they uh, uh, that what you anticipate they should be addressing in the future and that kind of thing. So this is just the beginning of the conversation, and uh, we always encourage people to continue. So the chat function stays up. And uh, you can go on social media using hashtag city talk and uh, let's just continue to um, parse this out with each other and figure out what the next, what the new normal might be. Uh, so joining us, uh, we're very pleased to have two veteran mayors who are uh, uh, stewarding a particular challenges particular to their community and particular to the circumstance they found themselves in, uh, one in Ontario, one in Newfoundland. Um, and so, gentlemen, thanks for making the time uh, and participating with us. So, uh, uh, and I'm just going to open it up by asking each of you if you can just give us a general sense of what it's, what does it look like, I guess, outside your front door, um, and what are, what have you been coming to terms with over the last? I can't believe it, but I think it's ten weeks. So let's start with you, Mayor Lehman. If we could just give us a picture of what's going on in Barrie. Well, outside my uh, front door of City Hall uh, is our historic Main Street, and it's under construction. We've actually hurried up the construction of wider sidewalks, uh, which was a planned construction project, but with COVID, we're actually accelerating the whole thing and hope to get that done in time for some of the uh, recovery. Mm. Um, 
where I am, where I sit in Ontario right now, it's actually a bit of a tale of three pandemics. We heard the uh, discussion change about a month ago to, to the two pandemics, one that's occurring in long-term care with absolutely tragic consequences, and the one that's occurring in the general population, which um, the efforts to flatten the curve appear to be working, although we are certainly not out of the woods. And what I would say is that the, the third pandemic or the third difference is in Ontario between the GTA uh, and everybody outside of the green belt. The rates of COVID and, um, and the rates of community transmission are quite a bit different. Uh, they are much higher in the GTA. Uh, and for that reason, I think the province rightly, knowing that people move around, are reluctant to let areas with lower caseload reopen at a different pace. And, and there are lots of issues that go along with that. Uh, where we sit today, we are in the midst of reopening. Today, uh, we are allowing people now to use our sports fields for individual use, absolutely no uh, group activity. People can't gather in groups more than five, but you can go kick a soccer ball or throw a frisbee uh, and walk your dog on our sports fields. Uh, we have 132 parks in Barrie, so that's a significant amount of green space that's opening up today. We pedestrianized uh, one lane of our Lakeshore Parkway uh, to allow people to walk and cycle. Um, and on Monday, we have uh, the first of our recovery initiatives coming forward. There's been an effort since day three of the crisis, on day three of the crisis, uh, I formed two task forces, an economic support task force and a social support task force. And we've really been problem solving for the last nine weeks, trying to help businesses get through and to ensure that our most vulnerable residents are getting the support they need. But as we've been doing that, we've been trying to build a bit of infrastructure. So the data collection on vulnerable people and what they need in our community um, has been tremendous, and, and I know you're hearing this everywhere, but the collaboration actually among levels of government and community agencies has really been noticeable. It's uh, not only are we doing things a lot faster, in some cases I think surprising ourselves with how fast we can roll out a pilot program, mm -hmm. uh, but the collaboration's a lot better. So, so uh, the first of, um, of many recovery pieces, um, in Ontario they've allowed a limited reopening of retail, and certain um, outdoor facilities, golf courses, things like that. Um, but um, we're looking ahead to when restaurants reopen. Uh, we have a very, very strong restaurant sector uh, here in the city, over 400 restaurants. They uh, employ tens of thousands of people. Uh, and we want to convert parking spaces to patios, outdoor seating areas. So our program to do that is going to City Council on Monday night. And that's an example of the kind of local initiatives and municipal led uh, efforts that we are trying to roll out to recognize that the keys to the recovery, and I'll stop after this, um, uh, to us in many ways are confidence, capital, uh, and capacity. And the capital is gonna have to come from the federal and provincial governments, and they are moving that money out to uh, the private sector and community agencies. The confidence is going to have to come from all of us um, uh, trying to tackle the spread of the virus and then be able to operate safely with distancing and and that's where it gets to capacity and by capacity I mean both labor market because there's no real child care solution right now and schools are closed so you've got half the workforce out of commission one of the parents has to stay home if both work Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, and the capacity in terms of the physical space that we're going to require in in the sectors of the economy that have been hardest hit. So that physical space piece is one that we as municipalities can really help and tackle. Uh, I think the childcare piece is one that, uh, at least in Ontario, municipalities have a, a major role in, and things like day camps and so forth may end up being part of the, the solution this summer. But in all of this, my last closing comment will be: we are attempting to look forward to do things that build resiliency as a community. So we're not just doing support or stimulus, although we're doing that. We also want to build capacity both in our social networks, our social fabric, our physical fabric, and our economic um, uh, infrastructure that will last. Because uh, as you said at the outset there, Mary, this is gonna be a long, slow climb out. It's not like you flip a switch back on and the economy is back. It's gonna take time. 
Um, we write summaries from these sessions and uh, it's always great when we have mayors on because you gents know how to talk in sound bites. So, um, because you've got staff there getting you key messages. So that confidence, capital, capacity, I just felt my colleagues' little hearts race that they've got three hooks to write the summary around. Um, you know, it's interesting your comment, Mayor Lehman, about um, uh, three pandemics. I, I think that, that people are starting to say this, and I'm sure Mayor Breen's going to, going to reinforce it, that the experience of COVID actually hasn't been the same. Everyone says, oh, well, it's a great equalizer, but we've been hearing consistently through all the work that we've been doing that, in fact, if you live in a particular kind of environment, your experience, and if you have a particular set of resources, your experience is going to be quite different than if you don't. And so, for instance, the discussions around density, if you live in dense environments where there are supports and public amenities around you and safety, safety provisions, you may, you, your experience is quite different than if you live, if you're low income living in density that was poorly designed, doesn't have the kinds of amenities around it, um, and, it's, and you're overcrowded because the, the real estate's so expensive that you've got too many people living in a small space. So, um, and I'm interested in your comment that actually you're saying that there's an urban, like a downtown experience, and then there's a suburban experience, there's a rural experience. And uh, one of the things that you two share is that you're both uh, cities that um, attract a lot of tourists. And so what's going to happen under those circumstances, I'm sure that uh, uh, what, what that's going to feel like. I, I love your parking lot idea. This is a tremendous idea. I was thinking about this sort of uh, uh, rhetorically the other day that imagine if, if we had, we're dealing with it the way Australia has, where our worst period, let's say, had come in uh, November and then we were opening up in the dead of winter. I was thinking. And there would be, can you imagine? Ugh, there'd be no possibility of it. We'd all be cuddled together in parkas trying to have hot chocolate on the road. I don't know how it would work, but that's one weird little piece of fortuitousness is that we're going to go through a period now where we have nice weather. So Mayor Breen, let's, let's hear about St. John's. As I said to you in the pre-call, um, I know Newfoundland well because I'm a fellow with Shorefast, which is um, anchored in Fogo Island. And, and I'm very familiar with the importance of connected connections and connectivity around local economic development. And I know that St. John's has continued to lead in that and build a kind of sustainable tourism uh, ecosystem for the for the whole province and I'm sure you're thinking about how that's going to be challenged but talk to us a little bit if you can just initially about what the experience of COVID has been in St. John's because I think it's quite different than it has been around the country so can you describe it for us? Well 2020 has been an interesting year uh, for yeah. us and it's only, we're only five months in. Uh, we started off the year uh, in January with a uh, record snowfall uh, which we refer to as Snowmageddon. Um, yes. We ended up in an eight-day state of emergency. Um, aside from that, uh, we had also uh, were under continuous pressure the past couple of years, the provincial government with our provincial finances, um, with having uh, the, uh, the possibility of high electricity rates in yeah. our future. So we, we, di we did that into January. We were just coming out of that. And the yeah. businesses, you know, when businesses are shut down for eight days, that's a uh, that's a lot in yeah. uh, in in at any time of year. So we came out of that uh, into COVID uh, nineteen, and at the same time, or around the same time, of course, the oil prices decreased uh, to about fifty percent of what the provincial yeah. budget was based on. Yeah. So uh, economically, uh, we've had um, a, a very very challenging. Uh, first part of 2020, and, yeah. and I would suggest it's going to continue for quite some time. So, in, in terms of COVID-19, uh, we've, um, you know, we never, we've been fairly fortunate in, we never had a high number of cases, uh, uh, but uh, we we did a great job, and the community did a great job, and people did a great job in flattening the curve, and uh, we were uh, able to keep those cases down. Um, we were under, uh, for the past 11, 12 weeks, we've been under uh, pretty strict uh, conditions. Uh, some of those were alleviated a couple of weeks ago and lifted and allowing some uh, businesses with storefronts, I think, are, are going to be able to open in the next phase. But we have some offices that are opening up. 
Uh, we have a lot of people that are working from home, which I think is going to be interesting to see the impact that that will have on municipalities in terms of finances in, in the future. As you know, our, our, our revenue is all based on, uh, on property values and property taxes. So yeah. uh, the demand, what happens with people working at home uh, offsite is going to be, is going to be interesting. So uh, we're, we're two weeks into the first phase and uh, now we're into, uh, we'll be coming into the re kind of the reopening phase, uh, the bigger part of it soon. Uh, it's, it's been quite challenging. Um, the, uh, the impact on the economy when you take all those things together uh, has, really, uh, has, has really been significant. Uh, right now in terms of COVID, we're, we're into the, we've, you know, done the things that we needed to do, like uh, deferring taxes for a period of time. I think we're up to August 31st right now. The, the tricky part is for municipalities is, is you don't know what the impact is really going to be. You don't know when the, um, um, what the, when everything is gonna come back around to opening. You don't know, really don't know what the impact fully will be. And uh, so we're trying to determine that now as we, as we look at our finances and looking at ways that we can help businesses um, and reopen and help them to prosper. We're looking at ways that we can um, extend for restaurants in our downtown area, mm -hmm. um, ways that we can get more capacity for them by taking uh, space on the streets for, for tables. That's, uh, that's become a, a, a part of our a, a part of our look, uh, looking at how we can help them uh, with some of their um, uh, some of their issues to to basically take away some of the um, uh, the regulatory uh, approvals that they may need for that and to be able to work it. So, for example, if you have a restaurant that has under parking spaces, uh, then perhaps they may want to. Uh, in the parking lot, they may want to expand their patio area. Then we have to be able to respond quickly to this, and yeah. be able to be respond quickly to our uh, uh, to our businesses to help them help them along. The residents too, in in terms of we're just now, our, our parks are reopened to uh, to walk through and biking. Uh, we hope to get them open soon for people to be able to enjoy them uh, even more. Um, so we've got a lot more people that are walking. We're going to be closing down sections of some streets soon for walkers and bicyclists as we get into the uh, to the better weather. So I, I find that uh, that in terms of we we need to react more as municipalities to what the residents' needs are and the businesses' needs are as a result of the actions that are being taken. So we we tend Nobody's got a playbook here to say this is what you do when you have a pandemic, uh, right. and we don't have one either because we're taking the directives from the provincial government and making the decisions that we need to make to help people through them and comply with those uh, recommendations and directions. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you know we've been using this expression that it's a particle accelerator. You know the the things that pre pre existing challenges or maybe also pre existing <laughs> assets in cities pre-COVID have either been completely blown apart and you, you're really, you know, you, all of a sudden you're really confronted with inequality, let's say, or inadequate housing, or, or similarly, if you had neighborhoods that had good public services and had good um, public amenities, if it, if it were designed in such a way that you could get out, those places have fared better. So it's a, it's a big, it's a very interesting kind of moment for us to do some course correction. I was teasing uh, Mayor uh, Lehman that I know his father, who's a planner. And so you were raised in a household that uh, I suspect had lots of conversation, Jeff, about why the built environment matters and how it makes a difference to the quality of our lives. And we now can see areas that were very poorly planned and they have not fared well and they have been more struggled. So it'd be interesting to see if we, we shift. Can we just go back to uh, this idea of um, uh, Mayor Breen, for, from your point of view, do you have a lot of, um, and, and perhaps not as many, do you have a lot of Newfoundlanders who go south for the winter and then come back? Did you, is that one of the reasons that you didn't see a, an influx of cases as you didn't have people coming back after March break the way Ontario did? Uh, 
you know, I don't, I don't know what uh, what happened in terms of the lowest, no, the lower number of cases. I think, I think the residents really came together and really made a concerted effort to to flatten the curve and Early. and listen to what the recommendations were and took that recommendations very seriously. I think there's a couple of things about Newfoundland that and Labrador that uh, that worked to our advantage. Being an island, I think uh, worked yeah. to our advantage. We, you know, for it's a strange thing, but things that were once uh, challenges that we had were now advantages in this case. Yes, uh, I think that's right. It's the, uh, the isolation it. was an advantage. Yeah. And I think too, the uh, the lack of density. We we aren't a very densely populated um, mm -hmm. city or, uh, or region. So uh, that lack of density also uh, helped uh, helped us out there as well. And I wonder if it's lack of density or just lack of people, because we've got examples in other right. jurisdictions where um, dense environments have actually that it's it's less dense less dense but populated environments. So Peel, yeah. for instance, in Ontario, is leading at the moment. Uh, I think, isn't it, Marilyn? I think it's it's almost forty percent of the new cases are in Peel at the moment, which is. Brampton, yeah, after and, Toronto, they're they're the highest. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're not all dense. There are lots of single family there, so it's a this is a it's a nuanced conversation, eh? It's a tricky thing. But Mary Lehman, do you want to comment a little bit about the particular things that you see, that you would say where Barry is different than uh, other places? Um, sure. Well, I mean, again, going back to the sort of Taylor two pandemics, the, 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 the congregate care. Um, environments which uh, proved to be the most dangerous mm -hmm. uh, during COVID. Um, we, and I, you know, I just knock wood as I say this, we've been quite lucky. We've had one long-term care facility have an outbreak with tragic consequences, but uh, even they, they were able to get on top of it uh, relatively quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we've been fortunate because there's 21 long-term care facilities in the city of Barrie. Let me just uh, ask Mayor Breen. Mayor Breen, how many long-term care facilities do you have in St. John's? Oh, uh, there will be, uh, there's the, there's one major um, um, government-owned one, and then there's a number of different uh, private uh, private ones. And, and have uh, they, there? it hasn't been a, a big, uh, there hasn't been a problem. Wow. So go back to you, Mayor Lehman, because we know it's been a, a un, and, and this is another situation where one of the worst cases was in a rural, Bob Cage, in a rural long-term care facility, right? Yeah. And I, you know, I think if there's a lesson for me uh, uh, out of COVID that rises above all others, it's uh, how, frankly, we failed our elderly in terms of long-term care. I mean, this is a situation where uh, infection, infection control uh, which should have been something we could have managed to protect people, uh, failed. And uh, there are systemic reasons for that. Uh, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. There are systemic reasons for that related to uh, who and how long-term care is provided uh, yeah. in, in this country. So uh, we all know that must be at the forefront of, of change uh, as we go forward. We're, but yeah. we're still in the midst of it, just as you say, Mary. I think in terms of the general population, going back to the question you asked, I mean, why has a Barry got so few cases compared to other cities our size uh, in the GTA or otherwise? I mean, so there's the congregate care piece, which is an obvious answer. Um, I think there is capacity for physical distancing that that is greater in certain environments. And, and yes, built form is part of that. It's uh, And uh, you mentioned my dad, actually. Uh, you know, this crisis has made amateur epidemiologists out of all of us, and we're all remembering how to use Excel again. Um, <laughs> he, he and I have gone back and forth with some of the case statistics and things like density and built form to see what the correlation is. And uh, it would be inconclusive at best. Um, yeah. So there's no question that large higher rates in Ontario, and, and not, just, not just more cases, but actually higher rates. There's no question about that. That's quite clear. Uh, however, is there a link between the built form? I think that's um, not clear yet, and I think it's one that's it's 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 going to need to be looked at afterwards. Intuitively, though, the population think there's a link. Yes, and I think you're right. Uh, you are right to say um, that there are certain environments where it is very hard to use public space and distance, and we've seen examples of that even driving the political narrative at the federal level. You remember, let's go back to week two 
the uh, famous picture of hikers at Grouse Point, right, in um, in Vancouver, that apparently set off the prime minister. And uh, so I think um, it's human behavior more than anything. And I would echo Mayor Breen. And I'm not saying that human behavior is different in Brampton or Toronto or Mississauga. I think though, I think the incidences of gathering which are affected by things like built form and the nature of the economy in the area and so forth. Um, natural human behavior in some cases simply results in more spread. And that's my guess. And again, amateur epidemiologist at best, but when you're sort of looking around the province of Ontario and saying Kingston, uh, you know, they, they had this incredible response in long-term care. They had a public health unit sent their inspectors out on day one did very, very deep inspections into all of the infection control measures, and guess what? They didn't have an outbreak. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so you, you know, those sorts of things are the changes that I think we'll want to look at first and foremost. And, and then as time passes, I think we'll learn what the impacts of built form and demographic and economic factors are. Yeah, there's this, there's this, uh, if I can just encourage people on the chat function, I should have said this during the introduction, can you direct your comments? There's a toggle switch at the bottom that allows you to choose who your comments get sent to questions. If you could send them to all panelists and attendees, otherwise uh, that's people like Philip Evans and I'm seeing a number of you here that are only, Chris Fraser, your comments calling out to Mayor D Breen, it's only being seen by the panelists. So if you could resend those to the whole group, that would be great. Um, you know, this, there's this interesting term, uh, which I've fallen in love with called, it sounds sinister, but it isn't, positive deviance. You know, you look when you've got a massive event of massive factors, you go and find, well, where's the one that actually doesn't conform with the pattern and what are they doing? And as you suggested, Mayor Lehman, and I'm interested in Mayor Breen too, if you look at Kingston's a good example, where they did a whole bunch of right things and were able to contain it. And uh, can we spend, can we be thoughtful? This is what I think the Institute that I run needs to be thoughtful about observing what what can we learn from folks that did it a different way and had better results and uh, and how does that help us going forward so I'm interested on the tourism side if we could talk about that for a second or green um, you've got an economy that is that's been in a bunch of transitions and I appreciate your points that you already had a whole bunch of challenges and we're hearing it from other parts of the country now I mean certainly the Alberta cities say the same as you that they were already struggling and then oil cratered, and now they've got double whammies. And then we've got parts of the country that are dealing with flooding. Uh, like life goes on, all these other resilience challenges, and you're getting, you're sort of in the middle of a perfect storm. And you've got an economy that's been transitioning from resource dependency to being about tourism, which I think means people coming to Newfoundland. So what is it gonna look like, do you think, for the, for the summer? for your businesses? Do you think there are, will the outport communities come into St. John's? How do you think it's gonna work? I think you're gonna be seeing a lot more uh, tourism in the province. You're gonna be seeing people Within visiting it. other parts of the province. Um, uh, staycations are gonna be uh, big, uh, big. There's not gonna be people, many people coming in, uh, if any. Um, so, you're not going to have the cruise ships that uh, that right. we've had uh, coming into St. John's and providing that uh, that level of activity in the in the downtown area and and around the city. So uh, I think the tourism industry is going to be is going to be very very severely challenged. And when I talk about tourism, like that's restaurants and bars, that's the activity that happens around. We have three major festivals in. Uh, in the summer, back to back to back, and uh, three of those are uh, are canceled for this year. So uh, that's now how, uh, that how resilient do you how resilient do you think the local economy is? Do you think there you know in New Orleans after Katrina, uh, when you when I was working there, you would be out in the field doing your work during the day. It was hard and grimy and desperate. Then you'd come back, you'd have a shower, and then everybody went out to a restaurant to eat. And those restaurants in New Orleans had been fed by tourism for years, but there were no tourists. So all the locals just sort of understood. We didn't cook. Every night you went out to patronize a local restaurant. Do you think, are, is there the will to do that in a place like St. John's and, and the outports? Do you think you'll be able to keep your tourism going with just your local market? 
I think we're going to be challenged to do that this year, but I, I am 100% sure the resiliency in Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and, and the people of St. John's to make this happen. Uh, look, if you look at what businesses have done in uh, during this and the way that they've changed, for example, uh, curbside pickup at restaurants has, I think, will now become part of the, yeah. uh, the regular offering of restaurants, uh, at least in in the near future. I don't know about because in January. It's, I, just it's don't know. I don't know about January. Are we going to be doing it? Maybe. Well, you know what? We 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 did we'll a snowstorm. Uh, like yeah, you, yeah. you know, it, you can uh, you can make things work for you, and I I think that we can we can make it work. Things are going to be different. They're like anybody talks about a new normal. Well, I don't know if it's new or not, but it's definitely not going to be normal because things are going to be a whole lot different. Just the fact that uh, if you look at the num amount of video conferencing that's taking place mm -hmm. is just a different way uh, that we're that we're doing these things. Now, will all that stay? Probably not. But we've got some certainties, and I think one of the certainties is that entrepreneurs are going to find their way to make their business work. What we have to do as municipalities and governments, federal government, is to give them the tools to be able to help them make it work when, we, when uh, they need the help. So let's talk, if we can, about what kind of capacity, back to your three C's, Mayor Lehman, what kind of capacity does municipal government have, or does it need to have, mm. going forward? I, I mean, I know you've had to do layoffs, Mayor Lehman, uh, I don't know whether you have, Mayor Breen, have you had to do layoffs? We've laid off uh, seasonal um, um, workers and, you know, people working in uh, uh, seasonal in our recreation centers, etc. But we've also taken on uh, people for the summer, our seasonal workers, because we have to have our parks open and they have to be maintained and, 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 and kept safe for people. But, the, but, but you don't have the revenue sources that you're accustomed to. You don't have the user right. fees. You've deferred property tax. So I know, Mayor Lehman, you're part of the uh, larger urban municipalities uh, on co. They've issued a statement. Uh, you're both part of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that's issued a very bold statement about what resourcing they feel they need. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Mayor Lehman? What are the financial implications for Barry? That, what are you facing right now? Sure. So we've had uh, three major revenue lines go to zero, which is uh, rec fees, uh, at program fees, um, those sorts of things. And then are transit fares. Uh, and those are very significant transit fares, seven, eight million dollars, rec fees, a similar amount. So, so and that's just gone, right? And it's gone for as long as we're unable to, to run the program. So unfortunately, we've had to have layoffs as well to try and take some costs out. Um, yeah, the broader issue here, Mary, is that, we're, you know, our fiscal federalism was shaped in the 19th century for an agrarian country. And here we are facing a 21st century challenge, 21st right. century challenges, whether it's climate change, uh, income polarization and homelessness, or now a pandemic. Um, we are so woefully short of the fiscal tools, but even some of the regulatory tools to be able to handle these circumstances. So what you've seen is workarounds uh, for decades now in, in mm -hmm. this country, starting with infrastructure programs, then the gas tax, uh, then uh, provincial collaboration, downloading of more uh, authority through the City of Toronto Act, first to Toronto, and then changes to Municipal Act in Ontario. All of these are symptomatic of how out of date our federalism is. Uh, and um, if, if I can sound a hopeful note, it's that in a crisis, it, there is the opportunity to crash modernize. And if the federal government wants to uh, respond and the provincial governments uh, across the country want to respond in a thoughtful way to create resiliency in communities, uh, it is time for some, some fundamental change. And, and what that means is not one-time transfers of funding, but shifting indeed in, in terms of uh, transfers of money between levels of government to allow us to respond to uh, the challenges of today. And it, it, it also can mean in many cases legislative authority being delegated from provinces to municipalities. Now, does anybody think I'm now making a case on behalf of Lumco for a, a power grab or something like that? This is a conversation that obviously has been ongoing uh, through FCM and through provincial and territorial associations 
uh, for some time. And, and right. we were compelled, I think, as big city mayors in Ontario uh, by the vision of uh, both the Martin and Harper governments to expand gas tax funding, which has allowed us to do good things. Um, but, but that's a, a very much a, a part of, of the solution. So I think, um, you know, if you look around the country, uh, you look at different sectors of the economy, there has been financial support from the federal government for virtually all sectors that have been hard hit, but not cities. And we do need them to come to the table and uh, our, our provinces will have to come alongside uh, because the reality is uh, the, you know, the, the services that are being delivered and the shortfalls that are being experienced fiscally uh, by municipalities are across the country. Uh, and they are essential services. We, we need our transit services to keep running, to allow people to get to work. I mean, there, we are fond of saying at FCM, there is no recovery without Canada's cities. But today, we are going to be challenged to, to do what we need in, in Canada to support recovery. You know, I don't know if, uh, if, the, if we've won this battle in terms of um, the communications of what we're suggesting cities are. Uh, you know, in my role, I get the media out interview me on these various things and they will say things like, well, why should the federal government bail out municipal governments? Mm. And I, it feels to me like the general, the general public think that cities and municipal governments are like another interest group. Well, mm. they've done something for business, they've done something for the long-term care, they've done something, and now they've been something for cities, as opposed to cities actually being about how we all live and the infrastructure that we're dependent upon. And here you've been on the front lines having to respond to the pandemic challenges. But even before that, as Mayor Breen said, municipal governments have been forced to have been challenged by a whole bunch of things leading up to this. I, I don't know whether we've actually persuaded people that this is actually the underpinning of communal life when 80% of Canadians live in a city. And as you suggest, we're in 19th century governance structures. There, I don't know if, if, when you look at how long you've been, you, you've, you've been publicly saying that you've been out of money for a while, right? Mm -hmm. Four or five weeks, I think. Well, just a thought and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Mayor Bream. Um, you, I think you're quite right on the structural issue, Mary, and that's why I say um, it's not a bailout that's needed, it's reform of fiscal mm -hmm. federalism. Right. Uh, and that can be accomplished quickly and when better than at the time when our, our federal and provincial governments are, I mean, I think this is eroding, but they have worked relatively well together uh, yeah. in the course of this pandemic. So I would agree with you with uh, the need for a long-term solution. Yeah, Mayor Breen, what's your perspective on that? I think one of the dilemmas though is the scale. So if, you, if you're a city like Toronto or a Calgary or a Vancouver running a big transit system, then your hemorrhaging is at a much greater magnitude than I'm assuming yours is, Mayor Breen. And yeah. how do we, can we get to a place where it's not about one size fitting all, that we need a different kind of fiscal transfer mechanism? What, what do you say to that, Mayor Breen, when you think about that? Well, uh, absolutely. I, I, well, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm part of the Big City Mayor's Caucus, and we've been talking about these problems for, uh, for, for a number of years. And there was a, an, an old saying that was used, is that the federal government has the money, the province has the jurisdiction, and the city has the problem. And yeah. that's yeah. the way that, that, these, uh, that this structure has, has worked down. So cities and mun all municipalities right across the country are on the front line. Of, yeah. of these things. And I think what needs to happen is, first of all, the reliance on property taxes as a as means of revenue has got to be shifted because we're, right now, our municipality, I, I think we're in the 83, 80%, 83, 84% of our right. revenue comes from property taxes. Uh, what we need is we, we need some other form of revenue that would allow us to make investments that we can get a return on. So if you're looking at economic development investments, it takes a long while for that to show up in property taxes. But if you were getting a percentage of the HST, for example, we, were, we would be able then to take some of the reliance off property taxes right. to be able to move forward. 
our, our structure and, you know, having to have a balanced budget, with, which I agree with, you can't borrow for operating. But it's times like this that they really cause problems for us. And so that's why we need the help from the, from the federal government. It's, uh, it's interesting to look at. And yes, if you're operating one of the major transit systems, you are, uh, you're going to be, have some very, very significant challenges through this. But it's all relative as well. Right now, we're, uh, we're looking at about a 16 to $17 million uh, deficit as we, as we finish out the year. Um, our, we've been fortunate in that we make good decisions along the way. When we've had surpluses, we've maintained a part of those surpluses. But I can tell you from experience, when you use up your, your if you use all that up, something else may happen tomorrow. It happened to us. We had a major yeah. snowstorm and then we had a pandemic. Yeah. So these things, you can't just use up all your, re, all your resources to get you through that. So I think there's a, yeah. a, a very important uh, role for the federal government to pay to, uh, to provide operating assistance to, uh, to municipalities and stimulus packages are great if you and if the provincial government, if the city and the provincial government can afford to participate in them. But if yeah, you I mean, were strapped I mean, for got, money. Yeah, I mean, who's got the money? That's right. The, the, or who can borrow the money is really the question. And one of the dilemmas is that you can't. Um, you know, municipalities don't have rainy day funds. You, you're not even allowed to accumulate them. So it's a, Jeff, what I think you were suggesting here is that, is this the moment? We're, we're in a crisis. It's inarguably a crisis. Someone's going, the federal and provincial governments are going to have to respond somehow. Uh, you're already cutting staff. You're, you're facing cutting services, I'm sure. Um, so we have a window here where something is going to have to give in the immediate term. Question is, could it lead to a systemic structural change? Yeah. So another revenue stream and I don't know what you think it would be go ahead Jeff well a couple of thoughts on that um, systemic change, first of all in terms of, of uh, legislative authority I think there are certain areas where municipalities could be transferred more authority and that would be beneficial um, not just every, in every municipality or just those that want it and this is immediately where it becomes complex because it differs by province particularly, but even by size of municipality. So that's probably the topic for like an eight hour webinar uh, later. A really, uh, a real thrilling one too. Uh, very exciting. I mean, we'll get a lot very of lawyers. Exciting. Lots of lawyers. Um, <laughs> the, um, but on the fiscal piece and you're, thank you for pushing for how, because uh, you know, there's so much conversation about this. Oh, we need to change things. There needs to be a new revenue stream. Yeah, but what does that look like? So a couple of thoughts. One is that you could do a bulk transfer. So the, pro the federal government has the health uh, uh, transfer, the social transfers. There's been bulk transfers over the years that the federal government has used to fund priorities like health care at yeah. other levels of government. And they can attach criteria to that, and a health act, for example. By attaching criteria, that would allow the federal government to continue to exert some influence over how the money is spent. So here's a thought. What about a Canadian resiliency transfer, which gets transferred to communities that comes with some criteria that says you've got to spend it on capital works, for example, uh, that provide state of good repair, that address climate change, that create human capital, what, whatever that might look like. You know, if we just and had it help- be, It would be a direct transfer from the feds. It would be one of those workarounds you were describing at the outset. They would leapfrog over the province or would it be like the infrastructure investment funds now where there's a match, how, would, how do you think it would work? I remember talking to the prime minister about this and I remember him saying that if you're expecting me to open up the constitution, you've got the wrong Trudeau. And I thought that was a great <laughs> point uh, because he's, he's quite right, of course, he's quite right. I mean, I think that, you know, you, you, ideally you do it with the provinces, but that may be the surest way to bog it down. I mean, I, you know, I, I would hope there would be in this time, if we are genuine about crash modernizing or have an interest in that, that there would be enough consensus to work towards those sorts of solutions. The second thought I would offer is that, yeah, you do a direct uh, transfer of tax capacity. Uh, that has the political benefits, as Mr. Uh, Mayor Breen will know, for the uh, upper levels of government that 
they don't have to be the ones to impose the tax. If they give us room, we have to say, yep, we're going to up the HST in, uh, in uh, wherever, Toronto, by a, per a percent. Um, and so it's attractive, I suppose, politically on that level. It's beneficial on our level because we're able to spend the money at how it is best needed in our communities. Um, but it is politically challenging and it results in a patchwork tax quilt. Uh, and the, you know, the challenges like, are you going to see shopping behavior move? Are they going to go drive to get cheaper gas? Right. You got differential rates of sales tax on a different side of the road, right? So all of these things can, devil is certainly in the details. I like the bulk transfer idea and I, I hope that the, that discussion will continue uh, because we do need a permanent change. I'm wondering if part of this is trust. Um, you know, one of the things that anecdotally has been reported is that how appreciative Canadians are that there's a lot less political rancor at the moment, yeah. or at least there has been over the last 10 weeks. There's been a lot less of that and more kind of collaboration and, and people were tuning into the prime minister and then into their premier and then to the mayor and there seemed to always be an alignment. And I'm wondering if part of this process, this last 10 weeks, do you think that the public has going to their trust in government and particularly in their local government, is there a chance that it will be heightened and therefore there might be more willingness to say, well, yes, I think my municipality should have more resources and uh, transferred from other bulk transfer potentially from other levels, but also maybe that people will say that they're prepared to consider a new uh, levy on themselves, um, a congestion charge or some other kinds of fees or some kind of any and other kinds of tax instrument do you think do you think the public are going to trust you more to to steward their money mayor breen do you ever think about that i think right now i, I think one of one of the things that really has to happen is i think there has to be a recognition of what municipalities and cities can generate for the country if they're if they're properly uh, legislated and and funded to do so, and I think that uh, you know there's that that old saying that or slogan that city building is nation building, and well, it's true. You build your country one community at a time, and the stronger you make them, the stronger the country will be. And I think in terms of, for example, the HST, uh, if if uh, if a city is looking at investing in the economic development. And they know that that investment is going to have a return for them right away in the, not even with increase in the HST, but taking a portion of the existing HST, then they're going to be more apt to invest there because there isn't a more immediate payback on it. Uh, it's the same as the gas tax from the federal government. The gas tax is, is one of the most effective uh, means of transferring money to the municipalities uh, that we have. It does have restrictions on what it can be used for, but they're wide enough so that it's valuable to municipalities and it's predictable. Um, so that's what you need is you need to be able to plan and you need to be able to be, make decisions at the local level as opposed to having the criteria established for you and having to fit far away. exactly into a narrow criteria. But you know, Mayor Breen, what I, what I wonder about is do you have an, a moment now to com communicate that to your constituents, that absolutely, that if you that that I then as a constituent can hold you accountable. Mayor Lehman was suggesting that there are certain kinds of responsibilities that he thinks Barry should take on, and I think as a constituent, if I were living in Barry, then I would know we don't have enough affordable housing in in Barry, and I'm going to hold the mayor accountable. Whereas right now, it's well, it's kind of the mayor, it's sort of the premier. Well, actually, it's the federal government. It's a big, as you say, I know, Mayor Lehman, we're supposed to appreciate complexity, but as voters, it's really hard to, to know who do you blame when something is not working, right? You know, one of the things that I hate doing as mayor is having to say to somebody, you know, that's not really our responsibility because to the person who's sitting there asking you the question, it is our responsibility. Right so on. your expectation is that no. municipalities have a lot more authority than uh, than we actually do have. And, uh, you know, explaining to them that in our case, we, we've been trying to get a new Municipalities Act for about 20, 25 years. 
having an antiquated act that doesn't give us the authority to do the things that our residents expect that we should be able to do is a frustration. So the whole, the whole framework needs to be reimagined. And you know what? Sometimes big issues like the pandemic are the catalyst for doing that. So time to sit back and say, this just isn't really working the way it's working. How can you're we make that You're channeling your, your, uh, your territorial DNA there, Mayor Breen. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time that, that uh, Newfoundland would be challenging how things are organized. Um, you know, in terms of uh, what, as you suggest, uh, Mayor Lehman, people, during this pandemic, you folks have had to do whatever was needed to be done. You couldn't spend one second saying, well, actually, no, that's not our jurisdiction. We're going to let that crisis just unfold in front of us. You've been compelled to be responsive, reallocate resources. Um, do you think that that's a, is that, does that give you more power now to be able to communicate these systemic changes? Because you've actually rescued urban environments from horrible tragedy, really. Much well, even worse than just Yeah. I mean, if I go back to the first few days of the crisis, um, the speed with which we shut down uh, our yeah. operations and so many of our public facing operations. Uh, rec centers, huge facilities, um, uh, public yeah. parks, tra change transportation, change public transit, and so forth. It was lightning fast. And, and yeah. if anything, I, I, I'm not sure there's a general appreciation for how quickly the government, uh, we, we were able to move as municipalities. And, and all of us were, were by and large able to do that very, very quickly. And, and it was unusual, I think, for for people who are used to government moving slowly in that old uh, belief, uh, hopefully that was a positive surprise. Now we need to delight them with our agility and our response. So uh, as we come back from this, and Mayor Breen gave a, uh, Breen gave a great example earlier about uh, the regulations around the, the patios, the outdoor uh, areas for restaurants. And by the way, you can do that for a lot more than just restaurants. Uh, retailers uh, could, can use outdoor areas. Change uh, rooms? Uh, are we going to have are we going to have change rooms and parking lots? Little well, turkey? I wouldn't go to change rooms. That's uh, I mean <laughs> but interesting idea. I mean, it probably get a lot more spectators. Um, I think <laughs> you know, I, maybe sidewalk sales better uh, better sidewalk sales. But, parking lot uh, sales, right? Lots of lots of parking lots. Sales. Well, I mean, truck sales have been a thing for years, right? So it's not a big leap. But but the point I think is now we need to really show that local government, by being closest to the people, uh, by being locally managed, can, can move very, very quickly to uh, do uh, innovative things to support the recovery. Um, we've watched this very public debate over converting public spaces to walking and cycling and active transportation in, in Southern Ontario. Uh, we sort of dipped our toe. We're certainly not a leader or a laggard, I don't think, in Barrie. Um, but we did a bit of it, and uh, but the, the point of it was, yeah, we're the ones throwing concrete barriers onto a truck, taking them out, putting them down, and putting up the signs in the course of an afternoon to close 132 playgrounds. I mean, we did that. We had to do that. Yeah, we had you to do that do to protect to protect kids, and and I would hope that we can demonstrate a similar degree of motivation and energy. Uh, in how we can deploy some of the things that can help people and help the business community as we as we come out. So, you know, we've started this thing called Bring Back Main Street with a whole bunch of partners across the country because we think it just gets to the heart of it, the heart of your community and how do you, can, how do you support bringing back your main street, the businesses on it, all the community functions that are on it. And we're, we're working with partners across the country asking lots of questions about what what are the key interventions we should be making now? So if you had to pick a priority, each of you in your jurisdictions, of what you, let, forget, let's assume the money thing gets solved, touch wood, and, uh, and, that, and, your, and your acute crisis financially is, is dealt with, and then you're gonna start to think about future. Where would you see the priority needs to be? I'm assuming public space is part of it, access to public space. But what else, Mayor Breen, what do you think is gonna be the thing that you're gonna double down on for the balance of your mandate that you really wanna get done having gone through COVID? Have you got a thought on that? There's, there, 
what, there's just so many things going on and there's just so many priorities to to deal with here. But the thing I, I, I you know, I think we have to get the business of, uh, we have to get the businesses back uh, to operating in whatever that new way they'll operate in. Now, I'll give you an example of something that that, that we're, you know, we're trying to get our minds around right now. When you look at universities, and uh, we have a, yep. a very strong university um, a town in, in St. John's. We have, yeah. uh, it's, it's about, I think it's about 8.8% of our population, one of the highest in the countries, in the country. And if you look at online learning and people not coming into the city to live, well, what's that doing yeah. to the business in the city? They're not selling their products if there's if the students aren't there rentals of houses based in apartments yeah who's going to eat all uh, those burritos i know the impact is huge so I, I think right now just trying to find out what the impacts and where that concentration needs to go is the biggest challenge because we don't know where this is where this is going to to end right now mm -hmm. i mean we go back to our snowstorm uh, we knew the snow was going to melt and then we were going to we were going to move on but right now we don't know how long what yeah. the ultimate impact is so i i think for everybody uh you know for residents to be able to to get their lives back uh slowly towards towards normal and for people to adjust to what the new economic realities are and what the new business realities are in the city is a mammoth challenge do you, do you have a, are you going to invest in some infrastructure? Are you, are you, for instance, going to be able to steer procurement, many municipal procurement to being, in, you know, buying stuff from your local businesses? Are you thinking about that? I, you know, we, we operate under a public tendering act, which, uh, which right. we have to do whatever we have to do there. But I mean, we're doing a main, uh, um, a main infrastructure project on our main street, Water Street. Uh, that's uh, that's we're taking the opportunity now to be able to, 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 to finish that up while businesses are closed. We're starting another one on another street. So our major projects we're continuing on with because the cost sharing's in place and it's necessary infrastructure to be done. Uh, but we're we're going to have to look at our other uh, capital projects because uh, we're not sure how much of that money we'll have to move from capital out of operating to operating. To operating. So again, it hinges on the whether or not there's a relief package or some other kind of financial tool and, put in. And remembering yeah. as well that uh, your debt servicing uh, yeah. costs, uh, yeah. where although they may be going down, we work on an 18% ceiling. So our debt servicing costs can't be 18%. It can't be more than 18% of our revenues. So if your revenues start falling because of this, then even though you're spending the same amount, you're still increasing that percentage. Mayor Lehman, uh, Barry was under extraordinary development pressure before COVID. Um, I'm interested how you're anticipating responding to that. Is there a yep. way, for instance, one of our questioners asked before you came on actually was curious whether or not there's going to be the capacity to uh, have higher environment, uh, green standards for building going forward? Or is there going to be a way to sort of take the intervention now and say, yep, we're going to continue to build, but in these ways? Or, or, well, how are you anticipating coping with what I'm assuming is going to be some resurgence in development uh, demand there. What do you think? Well, I, I have to tell you, there's been no lag. Uh, yeah. The development construction here has largely continued and is now now moving quickly. I mean, there's been supply issues, there's been labor practices that have had to change, but in many cases, it's been able to continue. Uh, amazingly, uh, the average home price in Barrie in the last two months has gone up, not down, really? up by over 10%. Really? Now, some of that may be that only higher end, very financially uh, stable households are buying because sales activity has been cut in half. But that's mm -hmm. still a very, very large number of sales. So that whole bit of the uh, industry continues to operate, not without its challenges, but it's operating. Just on the general question that you asked, I mean, this recession uh, resulting from the lockdown and the um, the uh, fighting COVID is quite different than any previous recession. It's not one that really calls for infrastructure stimulus, although that is an important piece. It will help. Uh, we do need infrastructure, uh, but I would say that needs to be much more targeted this time. 
and housing would be my answer to your question. You said if there's one long-term thing that we could invest in and change, mine would be housing. This is an opportunity for us, for example, to buy hotels and convert them to, to homeless facilities, uh, to, to renovate old motels and those sorts of things, um, to uh, buy or to build supportive housing uh, in our communities, uh, sp especially to look at new models for long-term care. Uh, and I think that needs to be crash modernized. So if I was the federal government and provincial government designing stimulus infrastructure funds, I would be heavily emphasizing housing. Uh, and uh, um, I would be as well, I think, looking at the social determinants of health and how we can use new models that yeah. may embrace what we need in terms of building that confidence back uh, uh, in the economy. Andy Thompson is determined to get this question answered, and I didn't ask, uh, ask it fully enough. Um, he's asking, uh, can you, would you consider fast-tracking the SPA process so the developers would have more money um, and they'd get the rebates for green buildings? Is there, do you appreciate what that question is? Maybe you know what he's asking. Uh, I do, and I appreciate Andy's smart questions. Uh, he often asks them at public meetings here at City Council. He's great. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, the, the certainly expediting the approval process is something that we have been looking at since early on. Um, Barry City Council started meeting a month ago uh, with regular meetings and we restarted planning committee to allow that development process to continue because there is so much pressure. Uh, and I've actually added an extra meeting to the calendar in June. So we're gonna go gangbusters to try and uh, ensure there's a consistent supply. But but his point is well taken. I mean, letters of credit was something that we did early on to support uh, builders and try and keep projects uh, liquid and moving as well, uh, trying to return some of those uh, earlier and with, with more favorable terms. Gentlemen, you've raised such important questions that resonate across the country, even though you only are from two of the 10 provinces and the 11th territory in the, uh, in the country, but you, you're talking about uh, real situations that people living in urban environments across the country are confronting. Uh, we just want to acknowledge how uh, appreciative we are of the leadership that mayors like you have been taking and your council colleagues uh, and working under extraordinary circumstances and not spending one second wondering if you could afford to do something. You just have gone ahead and done it. And now we've got this very interesting reckoning time where we figure out how do we backfill the resources that you've had to spend and then prepare for the future as we continue to hopefully build more livable and more resilient uh, urban communities across the country. So Mayor Brina, last word from you. Anything, anything you want to, have you got a nice uh, anecdote that you want to send the rest of the rest of Canada from Newfoundland? I, I just think that, uh, that as we move out of this and we get into the post COVID-19 phase is that it's all hands on deck. We, yeah. we've all got to work together to, to get through this, and to be able to take advantage of the opportunity that we have to be able to move forward and, and make sure that we're developing our economic opportunities uh, to, our best, uh, to our best ability. Um, you know, that's, that's really the key here is that we have to work together because if we don't, uh, we're gonna miss out on a lot of things and it, it will be a, a real problem into the future. Never waste a crisis, right? <laughs> as they say. Well, listen, thanks both to you, both Mayor Lehman and Mayor Breen. Uh, we, we asked you for an hour, you've given us an hour, we appreciate it. This has been City Talk. Um, watch your ra mailboxes, everybody, because Monday morning, bright and early, comes the roster for next week. Uh, I'll give you a hint, mobility, what everybody's concerned about, transportation on Tuesday. And on Thursday, we're talking about public space and how does that actually get navigated? And then we have another guest on Friday, another mayor. So thank you gentlemen for joining us and giving us a really important perspective on how municipal leadership is being uh, implemented and all the challenges that you've been facing that you continue to anticipate wanting to have. Uh, what was it I wanna repeat them? Um, confidence, capital, and capacity. Have I got them, Mayor Lehman? You got them, it's all about okay. resilience. And it, that's right, leading to resilience. Got it, on that, on that resilient note, I leave you wishing you for a good weekend. And thanks again, gentlemen, for joining us. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thanks.